Good evening, this is Annabelle and tonight we're going to be talking about IR35 and you and it's a big technical subject so we're not going to be covering it all in one webinar but we're going to get started with an introduction to what it is and why you might care. First of all I want to talk to you about what is IR35 and why should you care as someone running your own business. The important thing about IR35 is to understand it doesn't matter what label you apply to yourself or what label your client applies to you. It matters um, when you are paid in particular ways and it can have a massive effect on you because the client can end up having to deduct 30% of what you've invoiced from the invoice and there's not a lot you can do about it. So let's start off with what is IR35 anyway. If you look up the uh, Parliament website, you will not find a single piece of legislation that contains the letters and numbers IR35. The IR35 was actually Inland Revenue 35 was the number of the press release due, used to announce this. The technical word for this is um, the disguised employment regulations or the off payroll working. So it's been described as IR35 since the day that first press release was introduced. But technically speaking, it's not called that. But everybody calls it that. If you talk to your accountant and you say, tell me about IR35, they should know what you mean. Now, backing up the tree a bit to make sense of what otherwise seems entirely insane, there are a number of ways as a person providing services that you can get paid. The first one is as an employee under pay as you earn. The second one is invoicing in your own name. So if you don't run a company and if I were to invoice you as Annabelle K, I'd be invoicing in my own name. And the third one is invoicing as a company. So if you've got a company, as I do, I have my Renicon, which is the, the company behind Coffee Clutch. If I issue an invoice for my Renicon Limited to you, I'm invoicing you as a company. Now, there are two um, real reasons why getting this straight in your mind matters. One is it affects you when you're getting paid, and the other is it's going to affect everybody that you pay as well. So as, as an entrepreneur, you have two elements of IR35 to consider. Tonight, we're going to be focusing mostly on you providing services and the invoicing side of it. But this applies equally the other way around. It's really important to understand that tests are applied to how you work with your client. So the fact that you may be invoicing them doesn't necessarily mean that A, if you're a sole trader, you shouldn't be on pay as you earn, or B, if you're trading through a company, you shouldn't have deductions under IR35. Doesn't matter what label you put on it, doesn't matter what label your client puts on it. The reality is how you guys work together. Now, there are a number of tests, and we're going to get into this in more detail as we go through this series of webinars, but the key ones are control, substitution, and whether you are integral to the organisation. Now, let's talk a little bit more about what these things mean. So let's go back to the question of control. Now, we've got a problem here because if your client tells you what to do, how to do it, when to do it, um, and really specifies what you're doing, they are exercising functional control. They're acting like a boss. If, on the other hand, they give you service level agreements and say, look, I don't mind how you do it as long as it's legal and practical, but I need you to achieve the following things for the following budget. Although they're specifying what they're paying for, they're not controlling how you do it. This has also been a problem with the introduction of GDPR. We've taken enormous trouble in sorting out the GDPR element of your terms of business to, to make sure the client is not specifying what you do other than for GDPR where it's necessary to secure the data. Biggest problem is that 
Clients like to treat VAs in particular, and certainly other freelancers, social media support, even trainers to a degree, as if they were employed. So when the client gets over specific, which they often do if they're anxious or they're not used to outsourcing or they don't understand the rules, and you drift away from being in charge of your own self to being controlled by them, you have put one important brick in the wall towards being viewed as employed or as liable to our 35 deductions. We're going to do a whole series of things in the group as we go through this cycle on, on how to avoid that. Your contracts are designed to help you avoid that. But if what you do does not reflect what the contract says, the bad news is it's what you do that counts. So it's not a paperwork test for IR35. The next most important test, and these are not the only ones, is that you have the right to substitute at your own expense and that you have exercised that right. What that means is your contracts are set up, you're using our terms of business, to allow you to substitute. The problem is that a lot of clients don't want you to. They've booked you and they want you. Over the next few months, I strongly advise you to get associates in place to at least provide holiday cover, um, emergency cover, and indeed um, extra skills that you don't have cover, and start training your clients that you're going to do this. You've got the Christmas holidays coming up. You've got Easter before this really gets fully into force. Use these big holiday breaks to start getting your clients used to substitution. We've got a blog on the Coffee Clatch site, which explains why they need to. And we will be producing videos for them. I'm out speaking at a lot of employer and client events this quarter so that they understand why you want to do this, that you're not just trying to be random with their stuff. You're trying to protect them from these tax liabilities. And the final thing is, if you are integral to the organization, and when I say final, these are the key tests, but there are a lot more. And we're gonna come on to how to check your contract and your arrangement later on in this webinar. So if you're doing a one-off job, you're providing six training programs, you are doing a GDPR audit, you are, um, creating a website unless it's continuous back to back work that the minute you come off one you go on to another the chances are that you're not going to be integral to the organization you might be integral to the project but as long as the project's of limited duration you are less in the frame but if in fact they talk about you as part of the team they use you all the time nothing ever varies then you may find they come to rely on you which is great to have a client who relies on you but it can tip you over into IR35. Now, there are other tests. I wouldn't want you to think that if you pass those three tests, you've got it made. But what I can tell you is if your arrangement with the client fails those three tests, you are definitely going to have a problem. And of course, the problem is that in an ideal world, what the client wants to do is outsource to you to control what you do, to never permit a substitute. And you do become integral because you're so useful. So to an extent, the law is somewhat at odds with the way we like to trade our businesses. Now I want to talk to you about what IR35 means, because it's changing. But if you don't have a, a grip on what it meant in the first place, it's kind of hard to know how it's changing. So the original IR35 was, was brought in quite a few years ago now. And the idea was a simple one in theory, if not a simple one in practice. And here's what the idea was. If you were invoicing through a company, but in reality, you were, you were acting like an employee. You were just sticking the company between what would have been your employer and pay as you own. Then IR35 deductions should be made. So they applied the employment test as if the company wasn't there really. And if, you doing the job would have looked like employment. When they stick the company back in again, they make IR35 apply. 
There have been a lot of fuss about that in the building trade and lots of people think this applies only to contractors in the building trade or IT contractors. But the truth is the theory of IR35 has always applied to anyone. And if you talk to quite a number of big players in the service sector, they will go, it's ridiculous. I've been running my own business for years. How can I be self-employed? You also hear spurious tests like, well, I've got more than one client, so I must be fine. But if for one of those clients you act like an employee, you can be in this frame for that contract because it's a contract by contract test. So just as you could have a full time job and be a startup VA or a startup trainer, so you would be both self-employed and employed at the same time. It's possible to have one contract with a client that brings you inside IR35 and another one that doesn't. And although you, you obviously are in business on your own account, the test isn't as simple as I've got more than one client. And we hear an awful lot of that. Now, the original IR35 uh, regime required you to really assess it yourself. And um, if it all went wrong, the client was not involved. So if you should have paid tax in your limited company, um, then you're the one the tax man came to and you're the one that paid the fines. In reality, they've historically gone for the big ticket items. And I don't know if you've seen the news lately, but they've gone for news presenters, um, BBC presenters, people earning a great deal of money. And there is a feeling as a small contractor somehow that this can't happen to you. They'll never find you. How, how will this work? But they are changing how things worked. Now, the first change they've already introduced was in April 2018. They introduced a special set of rules for the public sector. Those rules changed the game completely in that sector. What they said was it was up to the end client to determine whether they should be putting you on payroll if you're a sole trader or whether they should be deducting a tax under IR35 from you. If the client got it wrong, they would be fined and they would have to pay this tax and they would uh, have to pay interest on it. So they put the burden on public sector managers and HR departments to make this determination. Now, to put this into context, HMRC themselves are regularly appealed in tribunal. And in the last 18 months, they have lost over 90% of the cases that they brought. In other words, 90% of the time, even HMRC can't correctly determine who is a contractor, who's caught by these rules and who isn't. If you're sitting there, by the way, saying, don't be ridiculous, have we got a tax law that even the tax man can't understand? You've got it in one. It is ridiculous. And this is where we are. So what HMRC did was they produced a tax calculator where you can go and check your contract either as a client or as a freelancer or seek advice from their hotline. And that sounds like a great idea. And it sort of has been, except for one thing. For about 40% of uh, business contracts, the tax calculator is inconclusive. And for another significant percentage, and we're still not clear what that is, but it could be as high as 20%, it's saying deduct IR35 when it shouldn't be deducted. However, in the public sector, a lot of public authorities have gone, we don't have time to make these assessments. So we're just going to deduct IR35 from everyone who invoices us through a company, and we're going to put every sole contractor onto pay as you will. Now, that hasn't happened in all public sectors. The, the statistics I'm seeing is about 12%. Um, another lot have made real attempts to make determinations, um, and they're not necessarily getting it right because they're using the tax man's calculations. Now, what does that mean? That means if you invoice a public sector organisation £100, they will pay you 70 What happens to the missing 30%? is that you get a certificate to say tax was deducted at source. When you get to the end of your year end, you will calculate your tax either on your own or with the aid of the uh, accountant that you use. And I don't know about you, but I can't do that kind of Mr. Mathics. And you, you use the tax certificates as a 
a credit against the tax you otherwise would have paid. So it's accelerating how quickly you pay your tax. So instead of getting your invoices paid and then getting a profit or loss and then paying the tax if and when it's due, you're having it deducted all along. There's no clear route, by the way, to get a tax rebate if you didn't owe any tax all along. And of course, the real problem is your bills don't go down by 30% just because someone chose to pay you less. In the public sector, this has resulted in a 12% increase in what people are charging the public sector because people want to be covered for this aggravation. And it's also resulted in about 20% of contractors leaving the sector which is caused, by the way, a massive increase in fees. So for those people willing to tolerate it and able to sit out the cash flow delay, it's given them more profitability at the expense, though, of trashing their cash flow. There have been very active complaints about how inaccurate the assessment tool is. But if you think about it, if you're going to be fined for making a wrong decision that should have deducted when you didn't, and there is absolutely no penalty on you if you make a decision to deduct when you shouldn't. What decision will you make? Well, you wouldn't have to be brain of Britain to realise that in the main, in the public sector, people have decided to make deductions and let the taxman and the contractor sort it out together. Now, the brilliant news about this is despite the fact this has caused a massive complication and lots of people have, have quit various projects, they're going to roll this out into the private sector now. What is going to be announced in the budget is whether this is going to happen with effect from April 2019 or April 2020. What is not on offer is it not happening at all. So to that extent, we've got to get ourselves ready for this. And if it does happen in 2019, that's within six weeks of Brexit, assuming Brexit happens on the due date. So we've got a lot going on in the new year. So we thought we'd make a start because it's not easy to get your brain around this insanity, is it? What we need to do with you as customers who are providing services is to get you to have a look at the contracts you've got at the moment that you know are going to continue or should continue beyond April 2019. We need to make sure that the terms of the contract are appropriate and Christopher and I's next creativity week is going to be devoted to making sure that everything that should be in your contracts is in your contracts. As you know, if you're in active membership of our Facebook group and within your support period, you get free updates. We don't know at the moment whether you need any, but we are keeping a very, very close eye on it. And if you do, they will be providing. But bear in mind, the HMRC test is going to be against the way you actually work. So we have got work to do, and that is why we are getting going now as opposed to waiting until the new year, because we need to start identifying who's at risk here. Now, who is at risk here is people with ongoing projects who are invoicing through a company for IR35. If you're not invoicing through a company, your risk is you'll get found yourself on pay as you earn. So it's a similar problem, but it, instead of IR35, your problem is pay as you earn. And people who are on repeat projects that are ongoing. That's not to say everyone else is in the clear, but that is the clear risk target. So we need to start getting people through these tests against how you actually work so that you've got time to persuade your client not to make deductions. Now, if at the end of the day, your client is not persuaded no power on earth can make them change their mind. There's no right of appeal. There is nothing you can do. Christopher and I are looking at putting terms in your contracts to at least ensure you get a bit of extra money if that happens. All of this is being tangled up with the Davis report. Now, I don't know if this means anything to you, but the contracting organisations have all said, if you're going to tax us like employees, you need to give us some more rights. There have been some massive scandals in the gig economy with everything from Deliveroo to Uber workers that most of us are familiar with. So this may be deferred to April 
2020 in order to coincide with a change of legal rights for workers or it may go through in April and they'll worry about it later. We are within a week of the budget, so we will shortly know when and we can start to make more detailed arrangements. But in the short term, we need to have a process just like we did with GDPR because we can't all skid to a halt on April 7th to go, oh my goodness, I've been paid 30% less than I thought I would. So now is the time to start to prepare for that, not in a frightened way or a panic struck way, but as is typical with us, we need to start getting our ducks in a row. Now, historically, there was great tax advantage to invoicing through a limited company. And if you went to any accountant 10 years ago and said, what should I do? They said, get yourself a limited company. Those advantages have been very much neutralized through the progressive application of IR35. But for those of you who are no, and at the moment that's running at 80%, who are no, you do need to talk to your accountant because remember the uncapped liabilities for GDPR. Depending on how much money you make, um, you may want to consider whether putting yourself in IR35's way is more or less scary than having unlimited liability for GDPR. Because you do know, however good your insurance is, you cannot insure against being fined. That's the general legal principle, by the way. You can insure against the cost of audit. You can insure against the cost of damages awarded if it's all your bad. But you can't award against being fine. So we have to, you have to juggle the unlimited fines of GDPR with limited companies putting you in the R35 frame. And you also need to juggle unlimited fines for GDPR, which I know most of us are never going to be fined for, with the fact that if you're a sole trader, that puts your house on the line and your car on the line and everything that you own. So it's a good idea as we work through all these tax and legal changes to get with your accountant and talk about this. But make sure your accountant's up to speed about this, because just as all VAs or trainers are not equally good at everything, some accountants know nothing at all about IR35 and are not able to help you in any way. Now, before you go, I don't have a limited company, bear in mind that one of the things that happened in the public sector rollout was the number of people, even people providing regular training courses once a month on a, on a six-month contract, found themselves suddenly being put on pay as own. Now, the way people are implementing this has been a crime, in my opinion. Accepted the invoices, made people wait two or three months to be paid the way they do, and then short paid them 30% and sent them a tax certificate. Now, that is going to make us real if they do this to us. I'm lobbying very hard with various organisations for a small business threshold on this that is at least linked to the VAT threshold, but so far I'm getting nowhere. So we have to get ourselves ready for this and assume that this really could happen. So what I'm going to be asking you to do is rather than do the HMRC test, which can be inscrutable, is to be prepared to start doing this test from Contractor.com. Don't pay them the few hundred quid to appeal it, etc. But do this test so that if you've got a limited company, if you haven't, this test won't work for you because this one is not HMRC's test and it is slightly more reliable because we need to start doing this work. If you want to know more about the techie part of this and you actually are interested in reading statutes and whatever, be my guest. I know some of you like techie stuff. There is a whole thing about off-pay pay role working um, on the Inam Avenues website. Now, don't get nervous, but do not assume that no one would be so daft or this could never apply to you because you're too tiny or unique. Remember, we had this with GDPR. A lot of people said it couldn't apply to them because, um, and the best thing we can do is make a plan to get you paid and to keep you trading if the whole world goes mad and starts to sure pay you. Contractor.com uh, are running a massive campaign against this. If you check their website, you can participate in this. 
the difficulty you're go you're going to have is that many accountants don't understand IR35. But if you tell them your situation in writing and they give you advice in writing, and I don't want to be mean about this, then if it's all wrong and, and you get fine, because don't forget we're under the current rules until April, except for the public sector, they can be liable. But the worrying thing is, even if your accountant agrees you shouldn't be subject to IR35, from the implementation date of the latest change, it won't matter because it's whether your client agrees and therefore does or does not deduct from you that is going to count. Because even if your client is wrong, there's no right of appeal. There's nothing you can do about it. This, by the way, strikes me as inherently unjust and it's going to create a lot of friction between client and service provider if and when that happens. So we are looking for ways to reduce that friction, increase your chances of not having deductions, have some great clauses in your contract for what happens if they do. But we need to work with actual test contracts now, which is why we want you to do the tests, um, so that we get a feel for what works and what doesn't work, really. So, yeah, it's great that your accountant can advise you, but one of the thoughts I'm having is we need to do some little videos to explain this to your end client because just like with GDPR, it got a lot easier when they got a grip. If they're frightened of IR35, they're just going to deduct the money from you. What we think is going to be happening, we're doing everything we can to support everyone. Now, equally, turn this around if you are the customer so if you've got associates and subcontractors you're paying the burden's going to be on you to make this determination and to withhold tax and pay it over now for many of us this is the problem because our accounting systems don't deal with ir35 now if you're a zero customer and i'm not biased towards zero i just happen to use zero so i understand how it works your payroll option is presumably going to be able to deal with R35. But if you're in spreadsheet mode and you've got to pay associates and you've got to withhold from each bill a withholding tax for R35, you're going to need to start thinking about how in heaven's name am I going to do this? So a decision as to whether to have associate VAs or not then. If you don't have associates, you're caught in the fact that you don't substitute. So you will definitely get caught in it if you run a company and you really run the risk of being caught in pay as you earn if you don't. So if you say this is too weird for me, I'm not having associates, you've just put yourself in the substitution problem, end of you being able to get out of this, even if, um, the, you know, you won't be able to persuade your client either. If you have associates yourself, you have to make that decision. But here's the thing. I don't want to live in a world where everybody has a job working for a global corporation or is on the dole. If we don't make micro enterprises work profitably, that's the world we're heading for. And I want a world where we little businesses can survive and thrive and trade. And so to do that, we've got to make sure that you surf through all this stuff. We have to survive and thrive in the gig economy. We have to make it happen. We have to lobby people about what a daft idea this is. But we also have to be prepared for it to come in as it is. And we need to start producing material for your customers going, this is how I meet the tests. Um, this is what I've done. This is why I really feel you should leave me where it is. If it does come through in April, this will be within weeks of Brexit, which I've also got my beady little eye on, as some of you already know. And the same is true with IR35. If you go on the contractor checklist, there is an additional support service there from people. It starts at 100 quid and it goes up. But at the end of the day, that's not economic for most of us. So I'm trying to um get it together to see if there is some form of insurance we can get ask your accountants because if you can get tax audit insurance for the people you pay that means that you you're less worried if you get IR35 wrong if you are trading through a company 
the Chancellor is about to announce in the budget the extension of the IR35 regime that's only applying in the public sector to the private sector. The only thing we don't know about that is whether it's going to be in April 2019 or April 2020. If they do that, we are going to have to work to make sure your contracts get you paid properly and to educate your clients not to deduct everything from you. But at the end of the day, it's the client's call. So we need to get ready for that. And the first thing I ask your cooperation in doing is to run your contracts through the um, contractors um, test to see who is coming in on this test if you're running a limited company as at risk of IR35. If you are a sole trader, no one can deduct IR35 from you, but they can put you on pay as you earn if you are controlled. So you need to start making sure your booking forms are completed correctly with service level agreements, not actions. You need to start getting your clients to accept substitutes and getting them contracted up ah, and being able to make a case to them that makes them feel comfortable um, not deducting stuff at source. And one of the things I'm going to be doing, I think, is a little thing about booking forms because a lot of VAs in particular who work on long-term contracts tend to do one booking form for the year. Yep, yeah, your Brexit rates too. But then, of course, you've also got to have uh, some plan for what happens if your clients can't afford Brexit. But we can only solve the problems we know how to solve. And I'm sure between us, we can solve this one. So um, we need to look at easing in rates increases. Chris and I are going to be looking at do we need to change the contracts? We've decided not to do that until the budget announces the date because we don't want to have changes on the changes on the changes. And we are mindful of the fact that the Davis Commission is about to report and we may have other changes in legal uh, status. And we just don't want to have the revisions on the revisions on the revisions. We're trying to do the minimum number of changes in a year. Now, if it's, if it's fixed fee project, and therefore you're risking the profit or loss. That's one of the boxes on R35. But your client doesn't care, do they? They're going to look at it and go, hmm, but are you integral if you're just ongoing? I certainly think with our VA team, and some of them are on tonight, you're probably going to need to start going, please give me a substitute over Christmas and make sure it's recorded. We, we all have the contractual right to do that, but I think now would be a good time to start planning it, you know? We do have VAs on project work, but we also have ongoing VAs, so we need to get our ducks in a row. But I think you need to be be careful, if you're going to put your rates up in January, that you've got arrangements that allow you to use your booking forms for additional work at new rates, that you're segmenting out what you do. One of my concerns, if we have a bumpy Brexit, is what do we do with clients who genuinely can't pay? Good night to you all. Thanks for joining me this evening. Bye.